This is the Indian Nest Podcast, stories of success from leaders and change makers of Indian origin. Why have Indians achieved success across so many different disciplines around the globe? I have no idea, but let's find out together because every story is unique. And we have a very unique one today with us. I'm very excited to have Ashwin Rangan with us today. He's the CIO, Chief Information Officer of ICANN, which operates the domain name service for the internet. He's also served as the CIO of other large organizations like Bank of America, Walmart.com. Besides that, he also serves on several for-profit and non-profit boards. I invited him on this show as he has been through an incredible journey of change and opportunity, going from Bangalore to Los Angeles to multiple stops along the way, like East Africa. Uh, welcome, Ashwin. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on our podcast. Thank you so much, Sanjay. It's an honor to be asked to be on this podcast. Great. Uh, Ashwin, they, you know, uh, to know where you are and the lessons and everything else that you have, we have to kind of go back to the beginning of the journey. So why don't you really take us back in time? Uh, you know, where were you born? Uh, about uh, your parents uh, and, uh, you know, the whole environment there. Of course. Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me to share my story. As you said, each of these stories is a unique story because it's our story, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I was born into a large, very large family in, as you said, the city of Bengaluru. Back in the day, it was known as Bangalore. I am the last of five siblings. Um, my parents were living in Bangalore, were born in Bangalore, and had been brought up in that environment. My father at the time was a mid-level Indian civil services official. He had been brought up in that environment. And my mother was a stay-at-home mother looking after a very busy household where besides the kids and my parents, my grandparents lived with us and so did an aunt of mine. So it was a very busy household with 10 souls in it at the time. And being the last, you have uh, both the benefits and the downsides. The benefit is everybody showers you with love and affection. And the downside is certainly at that point in time, um, I recall that every hand-me-down of any nature was mine to have, but all I had were mm -hmm. hand-me-downs. That is very true, very true. So it was a joint family environment, Ashwin, if I may say so? In a sense, because my it was a multi-generational family for sure. And mm -hmm. uh, we lived in a neighborhood where within three roads of one another, I think we had 11 different families from the big family tree resident in 11 different locations. So on any given day, I would find myself in one or two or three of the other homes. And, you know, just the cousins and nephews and nieces, we ourselves were numbering in probably close to 100 in that neighborhood. Wow. So there was always that sense of belonging and you, it was normal to have a lot of people around, etc. Ashwin? Indeed, there was a sense of uh, incredible safety. Mm -hmm. um, the school that we went to was a neighborhood school. Um, it didn't have a footprint beyond the locality, so to speak. It was next door to my grandfather's house, so it was quite common for me to jump across the, the compound that uh, separated the two properties and find myself in my grandfather's place with my aunts and uncles. So it was a very, very convivial kind of a place. There was little, if any, traffic back in the day in Bangalore. And, uh, you know, it was just a fun place to grow up in at the time. No, that's true. Uh, you were the youngest, as you said, of five and obviously uh was there uh, a challenge of getting some attention or was there as you said in many cases a lot of attention obviously the hand-me-down syndrome works uh quite a bit because you had one two three four uh, on but uh 
what what was uh, the psyche uh, growing up for you that you had to fight for attention, fight for things, or uh, uh, just talk to us a little bit about that? So, you know, there's a fairly substantial gap between the four who are clustered before me and myself. They mm -hmm. are roughly a year apart, give or take. Mm -hmm. And then there was a gap of five, almost six years before I showed up, I think. And um, my grandparents who lived with us, particularly my grandma and grandpa, literally took to me and uh, I grew up almost like their son more so than my own parents' son initially. So there was a, an extremely close bond, particularly between my grandfather and myself. Um, so I didn't lack for affection in that regard. Um, granddad was always there. And, um, you know, from the video that you're seeing of me, you can tell that I'm a big built guy. And so was my grandfather. So he was literally a larger than life figure in my life as I was growing up. Um, he was the first of his generation to have ever gone to university. Um, he'd graduated from a well-known Jesuit college in Bangalore called St. Joseph. And eventually I happened to go to St. Joseph as well to get my pre-degree, if you will. Um, following that, he'd had a checkered career as someone that would be a personal executive to a number of wealthy families in Bangalore. And there was one particular family with whom he stayed for a couple of decades as the, the executive in charge of the estate, if you will. So that was his background. That had taken him to all kinds of places. And he had a vivacious personality. Um, he attracted people and people wanted to be with him. Um, one of the most interesting stories growing up for me was on a given day, I was returning from my school. I'd heard my grandfather talk about the Maharaja of Mysore. And he'd laid claim to the fact that he knew the, the prime minister of the court. He was known as the Diwan. He said, I know the Diwan. And we had all dismissed it as a fable. But on this day, I was coming home and I saw this unbelievably well-polished, and beautiful Rolls Royce brought him in front of our home with a couple of liveried servants standing at attention. And I was captivated by the car more so than the liveried people. But when I got into the house, I found that there was a very courtly person who was dressed from top to toe and he was deferentially standing and waiting for my granddad to pick up his suitcase and join him because the Diwan had indeed asked for my granddad to join him for the Dasara parade, which is a staple fixture in Mysore. Yes. And I was like, who yes. is this man? I thought I knew this man. Clearly, he's, this wow. granddad of mine is a connected man. I can tell. <laughs> How old were you at that point? I was probably six or seven. Very impressionable age. And that left yeah. an indelible impression on my mind for sure. Uh, that brought you closer to your grandfather? Indeed it did, because as luck would have it, we had made plans with one of my uncles for me to join him to go to the Dasara parade. And when we got to Mysore, knowing that my granddad was already there and he knowing that we would be arriving later on, he'd made arrangements for us to join him in the front ranks alongside of the king himself. So it was just one of those spectacular early impressions of oh my God, this is really larger than life. I mean, to have a parade of elephants and horses and liveried men going past you as a mark of respect is an incredible sight in the Dasara festival. Yeah, and for our guests who don't know, Dasara and Mysore is a huge, uh, especially the palace is an amazing, amazing thing. I've had the pleasure, and obviously you've done it many times there too. So, uh, that was uh, so you were pretty close to your grandfather who he had a great impression on you. And um, how was the school environment like uh, for you? 
uh, competitive, easy? It was, uh, so first of all, the school, as I said, was a neighborhood school. Correct. Um, it was quite uh, common for all the kids of the 10 or 11 families in the neighborhood to be enrolled in the same school. But I was certainly one of the youngest alongside of a cousin of mine. She and I were the youngest in the family. But even as we were in first standard or second standard, we could look up and see brothers, sisters, cousins who were in the fifth or sixth or seventh standard in the primary school of ours. So there was a lot of uh, uh, familial support going through that. And uh, the teachers were also from the same neighborhood for the most part. So they were brothers and sisters of people that we knew. So it was a very comfortable kind of an environment. Nonetheless, so, it was competitive in that it followed rigorous curricula and there were other children who were smart and bright and they literally gave a run for the money, so to speak. So it was not only competitive in that regard, but there was an expectation of the family that every child would do well in school because education, starting with my grandfather, had been recognized as the ticket out from where we came from. My grandfather came from a village which is 15 miles away from Bangalore, but it could as well have been on the other side of the moon for all the difference it makes. It was, and still is, I get to visit it every so often. It is an extraordinarily poor village with very little to claim for itself. He came from that background where his father had been the school teacher there and clearly had been pushed by his father to gain an education and had found his way out from that very poor circumstance. So education was stressed as not just being important, but that doing well was an expectation from early on. Well, that's uh, a good point. It you know, gets you out of a current economic cycle. Uh, you had, uh, there were five of you uh, in terms of siblings, brothers, sisters, well, what, were, uh, what was the composition? Indeed, all of them are still alive and around in Bangalore. I have two brothers older than me and two sisters older than me. So it's brother, brother, then sister, sister. Brother, brother, sister, sister. Uh, any, uh, growing up, any competitive push, tug, pull? Um, my two brothers were and are very close to each other. And so the my ones, with, they're once they're, they're close to each other, the two yes. older ones, because they were closer in age. They're very close. Yes, exactly. Mm. And my two sisters still are very close to each other. Um, so you're the odd one out in a way. I'm literally the odd one out. Um, my first oldest sister is an extraordinarily brilliant lady. Um, she graduated top of class at the age of 14 from her bachelor's. She is that kind of a brain. Uh, she was 15, I think, when she was, uh, yeah, I think she was 15 when she got the gold medal for the Bangalore University in physics. And uh, she went on to become a gold medalist in uh, her master's program and retired as professor of physics from the university. So. She was always a beacon for me as someone to emulate and aspire to be like. And uh, she is very playful to this day. And it's not at all uncommon when I'm in Bangalore for she and I to be sitting next to each other and doing the crossword puzzle or something of that nature, something more cerebral, if you will. My brothers, uh, they were very protective of me as I was growing up, the push and pull and tug of local neighborhoods and fights and all that. Yeah. So they would look after me and I always knew that I could get in a fight because they would have the fight for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to have. <laughs> good to have a backup. Yes, yes. Yeah. So there was always a plan B and that was to yell for my brothers and they would, they would ride in and make sure that I was safe for the day at least. <laughs> that, that's good. That's good. Um, so, you know, obviously you're close to your older sister and then you had the brothers. Then, uh, you know, uh, 
So from the mom and dad, were, were there any pressures in terms of education? I mean, education was a requirement because to get out of the current uh, cycle, but were there any kind of pressures? Hey, you got to do well, you got to do this. It's funny you should ask that. My father was vaguely in the background. He was the, the breadwinner for the family. So his focus was on his work. And uh, as I said, he came up through the Indian civil services. Um, you know, that is a venerated kind of a civil service uh, where his commitment was total to what he had to do. My mother was an incredibly brilliant woman. Um, and she was broadly read, very, very well read and would push me relentlessly. She saw something early on and decided that she would double down. And that pressure was relentless as I was growing up. Nothing was spared me in terms of challenge. And the expectation from her was simple. She would say, you can think your way out of this think. So that word think is literally embossed on my brain with a hot brand um, and was from a very early age. So there was not a problem that she didn't believe I could get to the bottom of. And her continuous pressure on me was think. Think about what's going on. Think, think, think. So this business of sitting back and thinking about problems, it almost became a second nature. By the time I was a teenager, it was just second nature. Wow. But she was focusing a lot of attention on you. Yes. To Because she found something or you were the youngest, or whatever it is. Yeah. But the, the thing that I find very curious is she didn't say, hey, do this, do that, but she was focused on thinking, which is opening your mind. And that, I think, is says a lot about her, actually, in many ways, if you really think about that. Absolutely, it does. I mean, this is, wow. this is my homage to my mother, literally. Um, you know, I told you that my father was with the Indian Civil Services. Government jobs in India don't pay well, not even today. And back in the day, it barely paid anything at all. But it was more prestigious for the family to have somebody in the civil services. We were a family of 10. And oftentimes the race was whether there would be money at the end of the month or more month at the end of the money. So we were living hand to mouth, so to speak. Early on, I knew that I wanted to know more about the world. I became a voracious reader early on in life. And I had read just about anything that was printed in both Canada and in English, which was at home, by the time I was six or seven in, in years. So there was nothing left to read, so to speak. God bless her soul. My mother, would what little we had, when she went out to shop for groceries, would spare 10 paisa, which is less than a cent today, and buy a book from off a street vendor who might have been selling something. And that would come home and she would hand it to me. And, and I read and I read and I read. I read a lot. Uh, you can see the books around me. I easily 5,000 books around me in my personal library. So. That but, has it began, become, but it began there with her. That's right. That's exactly right. So Unbelievable. She just opened my mind to any possibility with stories of adventures vocally being relayed from our Puranas, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, and the Bhagavad Gita. Those were staple, and the excitement of those stories and all of that would be conveyed by her. And then she would ask me to read something and say, you know, she had me read 
the Iliad when I was nine and said, what is, how would you compare Homer's writing with Veda Vyasa's writing? How, do, how does the storytelling compare one with the other? What are the differences? So this concept of thinking with real live examples, it was ingrained in me early on by her. And I think back and she framed me to become who I am. She is that grand frame. I'm just a picture hanging in that. What an amazing literate uh, lady she was. I mean, I really am, I'm trying to visualize, you know, getting, she could have gotten you toys or something like that. Yes. But she was, whatever little, uh, and there was very little left, she was feeding you knowledge, basically. Yes. The foresight, the knowledge, uh, she was a homemaker, right? Yes. Yes. She had gone to school, she had studied yeah. until grade 10, and then she had gotten married and had become a homemaker, and the responsibilities of family had overtaken all her personal intentions. Um, her, she came from a family of doctors. Her father, her uncles, they were all doctors. Her brother was a doctor, and she had aspirations to become a doctor, but had never got the opportunity but it never prevented her from reading and understanding. Um, I mean, I remember being in high school and in a biology class, zoology class, and without even thinking about it, she sat me down and said, look, here is the way you need to think about the phylum and phyton classes and genera and species. And I'm like, Mom, how do you know this? She's like, just listen to what I have to say. It'll become very clear. And, you know, on the left side is the amoeba, on the right side is the paramecium. And the amoeba becomes the family of animals, and the paramecium evolves into plants. And I'm like, oh my God. I mean, this is incredible. And, you know, she just made it simple, playful, easy, and just opened my mind in the process. Yeah. I mean, she. Uh, was managing the house, but there is the other side of her, which was, you know, she could have been a physician, a doctor, all, all that knowledge, but she wanted to impart that and maybe see you get a better life. Uh, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the role of mentors and we'll talk about that, but uh, I would say that she was probably one of the biggest mentors in your life and uh, shaped you. Uh, no question. I think she was... She was much more than a mother. Um, yeah. You know, mother is a comfort figure in everyone's life. Everyone has a mother. And that love mm -hmm. and affection, that base is always there for the most part. Mm -hmm. But she was far beyond that. Um, she was never aggressive with me, but she was always assertive and pushed relentlessly. I mean, whenever I felt like I had done enough, she would say, go that step more and see whether you can take that because that'll that edge will differentiate you go beyond because you're capable of a little bit more and i would often wonder whether it was necessary to take that next step but mm. she would always insist that it can be taken and therefore it should be taken and that's become part of me now where when I get done, I have a habit of going back and saying, can it be improved upon now? So that shaped you in some ways about the way you operate also. Yes. Wow. Amazing. Uh, you know. Uh, so then, uh, dad, was uh, was he moving uh, cities or places, uh, uh, Ashwin? Can you talk yes. a little bit about that? You said he was in the background, so... Indian civil services are tough uh, <laughs> job to have. Yes, you know he he was in the office of the accountant general, mm -hmm. and uh, he decided to stay put in Bangalore rather than mm -hmm. pursue a career because his parents were relatively old and he wanted to be there with them and for them. Mm -hmm. He was an only son, and therefore he had that responsibility. Um, 
as I said, they lived with us, my grandparents, and therefore he chose to stay put in one location, but it never prevented him from exploring what else was possible. So when I was about nine or 10 years of age, he had an incredible opportunity, which coincided with something that was traumatic in the family too. My grandfather was a chain smoker and it was unfiltered, what are known as charminar cigarettes, which is literally the worst kind of tobacco you can light up and smoke. But he would smoke anywhere from 50 to 60 of them a day. So when I was nine or 10 years of age, he was in his late 60s and he was diagnosed with uh, a condition that required him to be operated upon. And uh, concurrently, my father had been reached out to for a couple of foreign assignments. And he asked my granddad whether he ought to accept an interview. And uh, these words from my granddad have become legendary in the family, where evidently he told my father, you know, don't be a fool. Of course, you should go for the interview. Opportunity knocks, and when it does, you need to open the door. So my father took that to heart and went for the interview and was selected for a foreign assignment, which fundamentally changed the trajectory of the entire family, both from a financial perspective, but more importantly from the manner in which the family's outlook in the world changed subsequent to that. Um, my brothers were in university at the time. They didn't join us. My sisters, my older sister had just graduated from her bachelor's program. My next sister and I, the three of us joined my parents. We moved lock, stock and barrel, closing up everything that we had in Bangalore the five of us moved to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. My grandparents moved in with my uncle and aunt, their daughter and son-in-law, and so did my brothers. And uh, we five were in this completely new place where we were exposed to cultures and people and practices that we had never dreamed of. And the next six or seven years are like a dream for me because I was literally living in a place that people aspire to go to just for a safari for a few days. Um, I was exposed to other cultures. You'll see me wearing a kara here, not because I'm a sadar, but because our next door neighbors in Dar es Salaam happened to be sadars. And uh, they literally took me in as another son in their family. And I got to experience that lifestyle. You know, the Punjabis, they literally live life larger than life. King size, and they call it. King live size, life, exactly. King size. <laughs> live life king size. That's exactly the Sardar <laughs> way. And I learned so much from them about both generosity and gratitude. Uh, they were both almost to a fault. and. Uh, Hira Singh Tethi was the name of the gentleman, the man of the house. He took me in as though I were a son and brought me up as though I were a son. I did things and learned things that I never would have imagined. Um, he would go fishing on Saturday mornings and had a boat between Dar es Salaam and Zanzibar. I learned deep sea fishing. I would get strapped in and I hauled in a marlin when I was 10 years of age. It was an ordeal that took many hours because it's more tiring than one could imagine, but it's an experience that I'll never forget. It's incredible things of that nature that I look back to and say, oh my God, how did that happen? Why did that happen? And, and uh, my wife, tells me that in my outlook, I'm more Punjabi than I'm a South Indian. And certainly in looks, I'm 
much more like a Punjabi than I'm in a <laughs> South Indian. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a kid from Bangalore hauling in a Marlin, I'm trying to picture that. It's just uh, <laughs> somehow. Not, and that also from a little small part of uh, Bangalore. But uh, you, it seems that that was a great positive experience going from, you know, you were in a kind of a cocoon with the family, you know, eight ten family, your brothers, sisters, and now you're just sent over to new place, new school, new neighborhoods, new culture, new environment. Uh, you did you thrive in that? Was that uh, were there challenges or I mean this Sardar family obviously just an amazing and that's part of the Indianness that we talk about. You know, really, if you want to get to that, that's, and we'll come to that at the end, think about, they had no connections with you. Nothing. They didn't owe nothing you anything. They didn't no. owe your family anything. But that's nothing the Indianness. So, exactly. Exactly. They just took to us for whatever reason. Um, we became very close, the two families. We were neighbors and became extremely close with each other. I would literally live there with uh, his children, Hira Singh's children. Sunny is somebody that I would hang out with every day. And Taji and I would drive around in his car. I mean, it was just a, a storybook kind of a, an, uh, an interregnum there. Um, yes, there were challenges. First and foremost, it was the challenge of language. I did not know Swahili, but I learned Swahili and learned how to speak Swahili in the process. And living with the Sardars, I learned Punjabi. And to this day, I can understand Punjabi fluently. And if I'm immersed in some Punjabi neighborhood for 10 days, I'm sure that the language will come right back and my lips will start forming the words effortlessly again. Um, being from South India, we had not been exposed to North Indian languages, but it was imperative given the nature of immigrants who were settled in East Africa for all of us to learn Hindi. And my mother, God bless her, she had learned Hindi earlier on in her life and made it a point to teach us Hindi by speaking to us in Hindi while we were in Dar es Salaam. So all children started to speak in Hindi quite fluently. The school that I went to had a lot of immigrants from India who'd settled in East Africa in the mid-1800s as a part of the people who were taken there by the British for laying down railroads and such, and then become traders and were, they were the people, early settlers. And they, almost all of them came from the Rana Kutch, that area in Gujarat. So they were Gujarati speaking, both Hindus and Muslims. So I, Kutchis. So I learned Gujarati and Kutchi. So it was very simple and easy for me at that age where language did not have definition other than a means to communicate. So it was common to go into class and look at someone who was from the Kutch area and say, Kuro kare to hirach. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and then, and then, Sukaru I don't know how to, all of that became very commonplace. So without knowing it, I was learning Hindi, I was learning Gujarati, I was learning Swahili. So language became this very fluid thing. But adaptability also, maybe you learned in, the, uh, in that process? Uh, you had to learn. Of, you had to learn, right? You had to learn. I mean, there was no option. It wasn't like people would go back to India because of me or I wanted yeah. to go back indeed. On the contrary, I would say that there was a drive in me to learn more beyond the books and to really experience what I had read in the books rather than just imagine what it would be like had I been the character in the book, so to speak. So every opportunity that I had, I would volunteer to join friends and uncles and aunts who would visit to go on a safari, for instance. Um, so much so that over the next many years, I went to places like the Gorongoro Crater and Serengeti Plains and Manyara and Tanzania. I mean, I was there well over 30 times. It was, it became a goal for me that if and when I got married, that I'd take my wife and show it to her and see it through her eyes again. And thanks to God, I had the opportunity some years ago to take my wife with me and show her all of the things that I grew up with, including the 
township that I grew up, to, you know, soon after, not soon after, but a year and a half after we went to Dar es Salaam, my father was transferred to Arusha, which is the jump spot to go to safaris. So we lived right there in Arusha, and um, I finished my high schooling from Arusha. And uh, once again, the cultures that I had seen in Dar es Salaam had been replicated in Arusha. So it was easier to adapt to Arusha from Dar es Salaam than it was the big jump to adapt from Bangalore to Dar es Salaam. So there were two systems of schooling. There was a system of schooling which was grounded in international schools, um, supported by primarily the British who had vacated Tanzania in 1964 with support from American school systems. So it was a combination of the two. And there was the legacy that the Brits typically left behind in each of their colonies, and that was a very British-centric schooling system. So when grades were announced in our school, for instance, there would always be the graduate certificate exam equivalent also declared. So the GSE results were also declared. So whether you had marks or grades, you always got the GSE equivalent grade sheet. Um, many teachers were British still because it was still in the early it was 1970 that we got there, early 70s. So they were still there. So several of my classes were handled by either Brit teachers or people who had been trained by the British to be teachers. So it was a good schooling system. Um, of course, when I went back and I saw my school, I could not believe how small it was. And it appeared to be larger than life when I was going through it. Uh, but that's more a perspective problem than a reality problem. That's true. So then, uh, Ashwin, uh, when did you uh, shift again from uh, Tanzania? So I finished my the equivalent of pre-university, my grade 12 in Tanzania. Tanzania. And then uh, we moved back. To Bangalore. And I found to Bangalore, and several things happened. I had, uh, thanks to my mother and the stellar example set by my sister, I pushed myself pretty hard, and I aced my GSEs. And uh, I'd been admitted to the Indian Institute of Management, uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Madras, in Chennai. And I, well, yeah. the most uh, for our listeners to know, one of the most uh, prestigious institutes in India, and yeah. the only and Ashwin is being very humble, the the best of the best out of one point four billion people <laughs> get to get in there. So sorry, go ahead. No, thank you for that. Um, but a couple of things happened at the time. Um, I was not yet sixteen. And uh, the IM said that you need to at least be 16 in order for us to admit you. you. You have to wait for a year, come back in a year's time. We moved from Arusha to Bangalore again to be reunited with my grandparents and with my brothers and all that. One of my brothers had graduated from university by then with a civil engineering degree and as luck would have it, he came to Tanzania and he found a job for himself in Tanzania. And his career eventually blossomed in East Africa. Um, so as I said, the family trajectory changed dramatically with that one outing, if you will. My grandparents had grown older and needed support at home. And my father was very frank with me and said, look, I need you to be in Bangalore rather than for you to go to Chennai. And uh, the university that your brother went to for your civil engineering, I'm sure that if you applied, you will be accepted there too. I kept thinking to myself, you know, I'm 15. And uh, when I'd moved from Bangalore to East Africa, I had gotten a triple promotion. I was in grade five and in East Africa, I was accepted into grade eight. 
so that when I went back to Bangalore, I found that my classmates were two years behind me. And uh, I relayed that to my parents and said, you know, this underage business is probably going to bite me over and over. So why don't I use two years and rejoin my classmates and redo my 11th and 12th grade? It'll be a more solid foundation when I eventually find my way to college. And, uh, you know, university may be easier without me being the youngest in the class. I'd already suffered the downside of that when I was in high school where no girl would even look at me because they were all older than me. <laughs> <laughs> so socially, it was a hard thing. It was a hard thing where mm -hmm. I was literally the baby in the class. And, class. You know, everybody else would be shaving and sporting a mustache and I didn't have a mm. hair on my face to show for it. <laughs> <laughs> so mm. my parents, God bless them, they said, why not go back and do your pre-university? So I joined St. Joseph, my grandfather's university school, and I got my pre-university degree from there. And then the university that my brother went to accepted me for my bachelor's program. Um, you know, back in the day, um, my bachelor's program, I, when I tell my son this, he gets a big laugh because he mm -hmm. went to university here and I paid an arm and a leg. <laughs> my university program cost my dad the equivalent of 10 US dollars for a five-year program. Yep. So I it's did incredible. that. incredible. Incredible. It is incredible. Yeah, I mean, the, the system was... And you probably got a pretty good education, right, for the 10 Yes, months. absolutely. I got a wonderful education, and more than anything else, I got a, a wonderful set of friends and fantastic yeah. memories. Yeah. One question, Ashwin. Uh, you gave up IIT, which, you know, as you know, people would, you know, they go to... There's a city called Kota in India, which is like a factory that produces uh, these folks. Uh, you think uh, right decision, wrong decision? Just because we look at inflection points in lives and you know things that could have changed because that, if you'd gone to IIT, trajectory could have been a little different too. Who knows? Yes, it's, uh, it's speculative, naturally. Yeah, of course. Of um, course. I think about it every once in a while and ask myself, could it have been different? The answer is probably yes. Um, should it have been different is a different question that I ask of myself too. And I would say that the time that I had with my grandparents, my parents, my sisters at the time, um, they're invaluable times. Their family times as I was coming into my own as a person. Mm. Had I gone to IIT at the time, those bonds may not have become as strong as they now are. Yeah. And if I had to trade off the one for the other, I think I did the right trade off. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you were pretty young to be put in that IIT stressful pressure situation to uh, who knows what would have happened. Again, it's all hypothetical. But you made some good friends in the college that you're brother went to, right? Yes. How was that? The, you built some good relationships, uh, et cetera, there? Yeah, I have wonderful friends from that time in school. We have What's a it? WhatsApp group. and uh, Even we were, now? Even now. We, we graduated in a class of 80 students from mechanical engineering, mm. which was my chosen field. And uh, I think 60 of us are on a WhatsApp group. About six or seven of my friends, unfortunately, sadly, are no more. But uh, a good vast majority of us are still together. We love hanging out together. Whenever I go to Bangalore, we make it a point to have a get together. And it's very common to have 30, 40 of them join up for an evening and just relive good old times, just enjoying one another's company. Most of them are over 60 in age now and have retired, but this becomes a, an anchor event for them to come together for, and it's a lovely time to just reminisce and have a good time. Yeah. The best memories, as they say, are the ones that are built uh, in schools and colleges. 
So then you graduated. Uh, then what happened? Uh, Where did the journey go? So when I graduated from engineering, a few things had transpired in the family. My uh, Both my sisters had been married by then. My father and mother, I was the last one in the family, so to speak. So a big home that accommodated 10 was now a home that accommodated three, just my mom, dad, and myself. And uh, our situation economically was such that when I shared with my dad that I wanted to apply for universities abroad, he said, that's great, but I can't afford it. And I said, well, I will do what I can. He said, you know, son, the best thing you can do is to find yourself an education in India where it won't be too expensive, hopefully, because uh, I don't think we can afford a lot. And it hadn't dawned on me until then that being the last, he had indeed invested what he could in the others. But at that moment, it became clear that I had to look out and do what I could. As luck would have it, and you, as you probably know, there are competitive exams in India to get into institutes. And uh, one of them is to get into the Indian Institutes of Management. I appeared for that, and uh, I was very fortunate to be selected. Um, the, the institute that I went to is in Mumbai, and our graduating class was very small. The intake was limited to 48 students, and the competitive exam was brutally fierce. We were, we, I learned this only later, we were over 100,000 people who were vying for 48 seats. And uh, I was chosen from everybody who had applied from Bangalore. So I was the only person from Bangalore to be accepted. And I landed up in this institute with what are, you know, colloquially they're called toppers from every university, from every corner of the country. So talk about high pressure. I mean, I'm in a master's program and there are like 47 people who are, every one of them gold medalist or silver medalist and ranking this. And I came from that university and I'm, I'm hearing words that I had never heard of as in I am from the Kurukshetra University. I'm from the University of Odisha. I came from Gwalior. I'm from Jammu and Kashmir. I'm from Gujarat. Uh, I'm from IIT Madras. I'm from IIT Bombay. I'm from uh, Regional Engineering College in Warangal. And these were all names. They had no substance to it. And yet these were legit guys all guys, by the way, this institute at that time did not have entry for any women students. So 48 guys, intensely competitive. Every one of them had fought their way up, if you will, and proven themselves. And now we were in this environment. The most pivotal conversation was the first one where the director of the uni showed up and said, Every one of you will graduate unless you do something heinously wrong that will make me throw you out of the institute. Each of you will have at least two jobs. Some of you will have four jobs. None of it will depend on whether you attended classes. It will only depend on whether you learn something here or not. And the choice is yours because whether you attend classes or not, you'll get jobs. The fact that you're here proves that you will get good jobs from here and they will pay you well. Don't worry about it. If you want to learn, this is a great place. If you want to get a job, it's a great place. If you want to learn and get a job, this is really a good place. And the next two years went by in a blur, literally. I mean, we learned a lot and uh, I thank God for that opportunity. I didn't have to pay a rupee. In fact, they paid me for going to university which worked out well economically for my parents and for myself. And uh, my first job was with what is today Tata Consulting Services. 
TCS. So TCS, and that's how I came here. So, I mean, for folks who know IAM, which is what uh, he got selected for, is like the Harvard of India, highly competitive. Uh, was it case study uh, in Mumbai or is uh, case study, right? So Mumbai was fashioned after the Sloan School of Technology in okay. MIT. Right. So they had literally copy-pasted the syllabus from the Sloan School. And it was very much uh, bookcase, bookcase, bookcase. Wonderful. Um, very competitive. Uh, any friends that uh, you built there? At Great friends. Great friends. Again, like my engineering school, there was a WhatsApp group and we have 35 or 40 of us on that group. And we get together all the time. My most recent get together was in DC when I, uh, I wow. met with several of them and hung out for an evening of old times. Fantastic. Uh, fantastic. So then uh, you graduated, obviously, it didn't cost uh, family any money because, you know, dad had spent all the money for the weddings and education, et cetera. Exactly. So, and uh, you graduated out of one of the best schools in India, I would dare say maybe in the world. And you then, TCS uh, hired you. And they sent you overseas. Is that what happened, Ashwin? Yeah, in fact, uh, it was one of my dreams to go abroad, so to speak. Why? And, you know, when I was 16 and I was in pre-university, I was, as I said, in the habit of picking up anything and reading it. And I happened to pick up a copy of a magazine called Popular Mechanics. And on the cover was the picture of a Tandy computer. And this is going to be a closed loop. I'll come back to this. And I saw something called a computer. It could be built from a kit. And when I started to read the article, it had strange acronyms like CPU and RAM and EEPROM and ROM. And I'm like, what is this language? And I started to get interested in that. And found myself getting engrossed in computeries, so to speak. So when I was in Mumbai, one of the options I had was in computerized information systems to specialize in that. I chose to do that by doing courses in that. So when I joined the Tatas, suddenly that world in reality opened up as opposed to being in the books, so to speak. But it was also a time in India that computers were rare, few and far between. Even in Niti, we had only a mini computer accessible to us on a timeshare basis. And if I wanted to run a program that was large, I had to go to TIFR, which is the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and run my programs there and get there at 10 o'clock at night and run it through the night and come back and go to classes. So it was that environment but it was slowly sucking me in. And I could tell that the opportunities were starting to blossom in the UK and in the US, but not so fast in India. So that aspiration was always there to go abroad and give myself an opportunity to see how far I could get in that field if that opportunity presented itself. So one of my target schools on graduation was TCA, team. So I said, you know, I need to join the Tatas. And as the placement game was played out in the Institute, you could appear for four interviews and you were out of the race the moment you got two offers. So day one, they opened it up and by 9.30 in the morning, I was shut out. I had two offers and that was it. So, wow. so one of them happened to be with the Tatas and I accepted that offer and there you go. So they sent you to the US? Yes. So they trained me for about two months in Mumbai. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, following that, I was told to appear for an interview for my visa. And this was, in fact, it was October of 84. So it'll be 39 years since I appeared for that interview. And I found myself in the United States in Los Angeles. Mr. Coley was the head there at uh, TCS at that time? Yes. Yes. Wow. Uh, yes. He was also a legend, a pioneer in many ways. 
Indeed he was. Yeah. Larger than life man again. That's true. That's true. So then you came to the U.S. and uh, basically kept, uh, uh, you started with TCS and then moved over into different jobs. How was that when you came to the U.S.? Was it as you thought? more or less different? It was very different. Mm. Um, I think my expectation far exceeded the reality of what I saw 39 years ago. I had imagined a far more computer literate and advanced civilization here, I think. I didn't realize that what I was reading in magazines were more examples of the art of the possible as opposed to the reality of what was on the ground. But it also sort of sparked the enthusiasm in me for the art of the possible, so to speak. So I moved here. I was immediately on assignment with Yamaha Corporation, which, as you know, is a Japanese company. I worked there for about a year and learned about multinationals and their operating methods. One of the people who had preceded me in Tata's, it was still young, it was a two-year-old company, but the prior year or the year before this gentleman had been part of the Tata's, he had already switched and become the head of data processing in a local small company, a uh, second-tier subcontractor in the aerospace and defense field. He and I struck up a conversation and struck a harmonious chord. And he said, why don't you come and join me? And within a few days, I found myself working with him in his company, being a part of that data processing shop. And sadly, something happened in the world that proved to be a turning point for me. The Space Shuttle Challenger blew up in 1986. And we were a second tier subcontractor to the space shuttle program. Our company at the time was about 500 people. It was a manufacturing company that made something with extraordinary precision required for the fuselage of these space shuttles. But the entire space shuttle program was frozen literally overnight and every contract was suspended by the government until the root cause was determined. In the process, within a week of the Challenger sadness, we announced a layoff in the company of more than 400 people. And I was in the process of getting my credentials to continue to stay in the country. So this gentleman and the founder of the company called me in and said, you know, we understand your predicament and we're here to help you. But on one condition, and that is, we can't continue to have you do what you have been doing for us. You now will need to do everything that you can so that we continue to keep the shop open. And I said, what does that mean? They said, well, you know, notwithstanding your master's degree and all of that, we need someone who can be a computer operator. And if you're willing to be that, then you can do whatever else you want to, but we need to let the operator go and we'll keep you. And I said, well, if that's the only option, then that's the option. So I picked that up as the option. And I got to tell you, the next two years, I work from four in the afternoon to one o'clock at night. I learned more about computers, information systems, operations, development, database management. I mean, I learned more about everything than I have in any other period of time. That was formative to the point that to this day, given my curiosity, my reading and that experience, there's not much that goes on that I'm not able to connect the dots really fast and come to the right conclusion. So that was literally a case of life served me lemons and I made a lot of great lemonade there. Because you had to do it. Your back was to the wall. You didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. 
but it gave you strong fundamentals that you probably couldn't have gotten in a CS computer science degree. You, That's right. He got to know what probably what operating systems, assembly, have all those assembly language and all that yep. other stuff uh, that uh, they teach you in CS. So, wow. Yep. So that was also an inflection point for you. Uh, definitely, definitely an inflection point for me. And, uh -huh. you know, soon thereafter, my third inflection point was my, my lovely wife who went to university with me to do her bachelor. She was a year junior to me. We mm -hmm. got to know each other. We fell in love. She moved here and we wanted to get married. So when we got married, I said, I'm going to look for another position where we can be a little bit better off. Perhaps you can find mm -hmm. something. She found a job for herself in a city called Newport Beach in Southern California. So I started to look for something close to that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And my third inflection point happened where I crossed paths with a gentleman by the name of Safi Kureshi, who mm. had just AST. Then, AST, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Safi and I met and he said, you know, we need somebody. And I joined AST. I was in the first few people to join the company. We took that company from literally a garage outfit to a Fortune 500 company over the next many years. And I grew and grew and grew and grew and grew there. I mean, when I left, we had just transacted AST to Samsung. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was responsible by then for everything that was happening outside of the U.S. from an information services perspective. Well, for people who don't know, and believe me, a lot of people don't, I'm sure you know that. AST was like the pioneer. It's maybe it was the Dell before Dell in many ways, to be yes. uh, frank with you. It really popularized the PC culture, and they were pioneers. Uh, so amazing. So that was an incredible journey also for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Safi took me under his wing. We are great friends. We are neighbors. He lives, I live within a mile of him. I shouldn't say he lives within a mile of me. Yeah. He's a much more accomplished gentleman, but he continues to be a great friend and a good mentor. I look up to him for all kinds of advice still. Fantastic. So the journey has been very, very interesting. Uh, and now obviously, you know, you had uh, leadership roles at Walmart and you know, other large companies, and now you're an icon. Uh, you know, for a kid from a small place outside Bangalore, that's an incredible uh, journey. Uh, where do you see this journey going forward? Because you still have, uh, one thing I can tell you is, the thing I see about you is a sense of curiosity that you have. And so that's going to keep going, going, going. Uh, so where do you see this uh, journey going forward, uh, Ashwin? You know, that's a, it's a question that I ask of myself too, from purely an information services standpoint. Being an ICANN is an incredible honor. Um, being head of technology and the chief engineer for ICANN is, I mean, there is no bigger engineering job in the world in the day of the internet. So to have the ability for me to say that I served in that capacity is a matter of honor as much as it is a matter of pride that they found me capable of even being offered that. Um, it's a little bit of a pinch yourself moment whenever I think about that. And certainly over the last 10 years, it's been a privilege to serve ICANN and to see the growth of the internet. I recall an early conversation with the then chairman of the board, who was also one of the founders of what now is the internet itself. He'd said, we now have 2.4 billion people on the internet, Ashwin. The population is 7 billion. This is 10 years ago. He said, what can you do to help us? And my first thought was my mother and the think imprint on my brain saying, what can I do? And I said, I'll come back. And I did. And I came back with a plan. 
and we worked the plan. And 10 years later, the world's population is 8 billion and 5.2 billion people are on the internet. So we more than doubled the internet. Doubled. So Amazing. I am Amazing. happy about Kudos. that. Kudos. Kudos. Yeah. yeah. It's not just me. It's a lot of organizations and people yeah. and countries and policies and all kinds of things have come together to make the internet what it is. But, you know, I still think of a country like Djibouti in the Horn of Africa, where internet penetration is 6%. 94% of the people there have yet to see what the magic of the internet is. So there is work to be done still. There are hurdles to be overcome. There are people who are literate in the language of Kannada in my Karnataka, who can't get on the internet because they don't know a word of English. So we have taught the internet Kannada as a language so that now they can put a URL entry in Kannada and it'll resolve and take them to a website, if only there is a website with Kannada content. So there's a lot going on in the background, and I've had a role to play in all of that, and that's a matter of pride and privilege. Yeah. You know, you mentioned mentoring. My wife and I have had the privilege of mentoring students of Indian origin who come to multiple universities over the last 20 years. We created a program with the University of California and Irvine with the master's program. Every year, whoever comes fresh from India and it's their first time outside the country, we take on one of them as our mentee. And likewise, we find other families over the years who have become mentors as well. And we place these students with mentors. We love the process of watching them grow. Some of them have become top-notch executives in their own right. And it is just incredible to watch how their careers are blossoming. There are chief marketing officers, chief information officers, CEOs, founders of companies. These are all many pieces of ours over the last many years. I can see being very happy being just a mentor. Um, that would be curiosity enough to see how those trajectories take form and progress. I often think that if I were to retire, I might offer services as a professor somewhere and be useful and help shape and develop youngsters. I think you'd be fantastic at it. I mean, I'm, like I said, this session, I've learned a lot. Um, uh, you're already mentoring people. You'd like to mentor more. Do you think you learn sometimes from even the mentees? I mean, yes, they learn a lot from you, but sometimes do you think the mentees also have a, something to teach the mentors too? I think it's very true. I think it's a very symbiotic connection between mentees and mentors. Um, some of my mentees are going through journeys that are difficult and Frankly, I've encouraged them to take those pathways because a difficult pathway does not necessarily make it a bad one. Oftentimes, the difficulty prevents most others from approaching that pathway. And therefore, that may be the one that leads you to where you really want to go. So I have shown that more difficult pathway to several of my mentees and encourage them to take that with the assurance from me that I will be holding their hands and that together we'll figure it out. And they have found incredible outcomes in that, both personally and professionally, and certainly financially. So I think they teach me through that process because their difficulties are unlike things that I've ever imagined, whereas Hutzpalon might have told me to tell them to take that path. They are actually experiencing that path on a day-to-day, step-by-step basis. And I'm only there to help them when they find that they're unable to take the next step. They reach back and say, what do I do now? And we talk it through and think it through and get to the next step and the next stage and so on and so forth. So they teach me all the time. I feel humbled all the time that there is so much that I don't know and that they choose to keep me with them on the journey 
And regardless of the difficulty, they still have the trust in me that they can come back and can talk about it. I feel blessed. I was telling Deepa, my wife, that we now have an awesome responsibility. You know, if you go back to the Mahabharata, one of the things that had always intrigued me in reading the Mahabharata was that the Kauravas had 101 siblings, 100 brothers and one sister. And I would often disregard the connotations that came through in the story, but wonder about the largeness of that family and say, what must it have felt like to have 100 plus people under one roof? Being from a roof that hosted 10, I know how chaotic life would be. But 100 must have been incredible, regardless of how wealthy you were as a king, perhaps. But I look back and I feel blessed. I was telling Deepa, you know, it's an incredible, awesome responsibility. We have our set of twins, and that's just two, but we have 58 other children who have been mentees of ours. We have a 60 children family that you and I are responsible for. And it is such a fantastic, fun, emotional experience. Well, I think you're a great mentor and you'd be a great professor. Uh, Ashwin, uh, towards the end, and uh, you know, I could go on for hours and hours. There's so much to learn from you. We ask, uh, basically, we call it the lightning round of basic quick questions, uh, just very brief answer. Uh, and you kind of have alluded to that throughout your conversation. What is your definition of Indianness? This is a podcast about Indianness. If you were to just give a brief answer to that. I think Indianness for me is an amalgam of a few words with all the connotations that they bring. One is a philosophical outlook. The second is a pragmatic outlook. And the third is a spirit of Jugad, which is being innovative on the fly. And the last one I would say for those colleagues that I've witnessed, hopefully I would consider me to be one of them too, is a spirit of relentlessness. Never give up. Great definition. Perseverance, relentless, jigar or innovativeness. Um, I agree. Um, that's a great definition. Uh, last question, someone not in your family, someone alive, either in India or uh, outside India, of Indian origin, that inspires you, someone alive, one person. You know, that's a, <laughs> Tough that's a very difficult one. Well, try. Different people, yeah. different people inspire me in different ways, uh, uh, people of Indian or origin. Yeah, one or two or three. We ask that to everybody, and we're putting a cloud together for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I think given, I'm going to center this in India more so mm -hmm. than I center it here. If I center it in India, and given the current state of India and the aspirations that India has as a nation, the potential that it's starting to realize, I think of infrastructure projects that are being brought to life by Nitin Gadkari. I think the far-reaching consequences of physical infrastructure in India that he is so foresightful about will have repercussions for decades, if not generations, to come. Um, the perspectives of India and Indianness being expressed by Jay Shankar I think are exemplar where I heard him speak recently where he said, when we talk of complexities as Indians, why do we refer to the Gordian knot and the sword of Democles when we have so many examples in Indian literature that are much more complex? 
if we want to be Indian, should we not be at least using our own examples rather than using examples that we were taught by the Europeans just because the schools were set up by them? I think that's just an example of how to think differently. I admire him. He's a distant relative of mine. I admire him immensely for what he is doing for India in terms of projecting that Indianness outward and abroad. And um, I think of our finance minister there. I think she's doing a fantastic job with the kind of technology embrace that the financial payment systems in India have now come up with, where in a short five-year period, India has overtaken many, if not most, nations on the face of the earth with electronic e-pay capabilities, with UPI and Paytm and phone pay. And I mean, it's incredible to become a cashless society at the level of a street side vendor in such a short period of time, which also speaks to the embrace of mobile technologies and the capabilities that it brings. So those are three examples that I can cite. They're great examples. Uh, uh, Nitin Gadkari, Jai Shankar, and Nirmala Sitaraman. And as far as Gadkari is concerned, the expressway between Bangalore and Mysore is a good testament because I've traveled that many, many times. and used to take forever, and now it takes an hour and a half. But anyway, that's a separate uh, thing. But uh, those are great examples, Ashwin. And this has been just fabulous. As I said, I could go on out, and I know how busy you are. Uh, thank you so, so very much, really, really, for being open, for inspiring everybody here. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for thank asking. You. Appreciate and it. Thank you. Thank you.